Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast. My name is Philip and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 47, Roman Places of Seeing. As a coda to season two of the podcast, I've something a bit different. Near to the beginning of season one, in episode three, in fact, I attempted to imagine what the experience of going to the theatre in ancient Athens might have been like. That part of the episode was a fictional account, but based on many of the facts and assumptions that I went on to discuss in the podcast as we travelled through Greek theatre together. It was fun to put together and, I'm pleased to say, is one of the most frequently downloaded episodes in the back catalogue. So I thought it would be a good way to end the Roman season with a similar attempt to get back to the experience of theatre going in Rome. It's a fiction, again, and a personal view, but I hope you enjoy it. This is the final episode of the Roman season, and I'm going to take a short break from the narrative to recover, recharge the batteries and dig deeply into the next phase of theatre history. I also have several other plans I'm working on for material to support the podcast and for more guests to come on and talk about theatre and history, so please watch out for some bonus episodes during the hiatus, or better still, just hit that subscribe button so the episodes pop into your listening list as they are published and you don't miss out. In the meantime, you can always contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Please do take a look at the patreon.com offering and consider signing up there for extra content. Several extra episodes and transcripts are available up there already and immediately once you've signed up. And I'll continue to add to these during the break. If there's anything in theatre history that you'd like to hear more on, please do get in touch and let me know, as listener Bruce did. Subject to the research, I'm happy to put special listener-led episodes together, and Bruce, I'm working on it. My thanks to all of you who've already signed up for Patreon, and to those of you who've posted a review. All support in whatever form it takes is gratefully received and very much appreciated. And I was asked about the theme music for the podcast by listener Martin. It's a little ditty called Walk With Me, and it comes from an online subscription service. At the end of the episode, I'll let all 1 minute 19 seconds of the tune play out without speaking over it, so you can enjoy the full version. So, I'll be back soon for Season 3, but in the meantime, please sit back and enjoy the last episode of Season 2 of the History of European Theatre podcast, The Theatre of Rome. To my dear friend, greetings. I wish you good health and grace of the gods in all things and earnestly hope that your humours are now in a better balance. My desire is that this letter will help you to raise yourself again from the malaise that has affected you so recently. We're sorry that you couldn't join us yesterday and we missed your company. I thought that by way of a distraction from the tedium of what I hope is your ever-improving recovery, you would like to hear about our day. As you know, we were honoured to receive the invitation and to spend time with Gaius Camillius Galabrio and his guests at the theatre. It was a great kindness to myself and my family. Both Vasnia Ariana and I enjoyed our day out immensely, and I must say, we really made a day of it. We had not been to the new theatre before, or near it, with our home being some distance from the Campus Marius. I think it must be a year or more since we heard about the dedication ceremonies and what grand celebration that it was. But you'll be interested to hear that we did notice there's still some building work in progress in a few places, incomplete paving in some places, and workmen suspended from the roof working on some marble facing. Not to criticise former consul Gnaeus Pompeius, though. One can hardly blame him for wanting to get the theatre open as soon as it was seemly. What a place! We were quite taken aback when we first caught sight of it. Such a magnificent building. We do have so much to thank the former consul for, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I've just poured myself a generous measure of the wine you kindly sent us earlier in the year. It is delicious, and I shall be sipping it as I write, despite the early hour. You are, as ever, most generous. So, my story of the day. We left home early that morning, keen to miss the heat of the day. Rome is so hot this time of year. But Vesnia Ariana was keen to see the city and be away from the home for a change. As it was a festival day, I thought this appropriate enough, and of course she dressed sensibly. And we had her best serving woman with us, as well as my slave. I think you will remember him from when I last visited you. He is very memorable, being of such a dark hue and such a large chap. 
He is very useful when there are crowds in the city. He can clear a path most effectively. I fear that I may one day lose him to the gladiator school. He clearly has ambitions, and I try to quash them as firmly as I can. I wouldn't say that he's a brute, but I'm sure he could hold his own in a fight. But he's not the sharpest tool in the chest either. But strength will out, they say, so I may have to relent one day and sell him on to a trainer. As long as they make the right offer, by Jove. When we are next able to meet, your health permitting, I must talk to you about acquiring a new slave as a tutor to the boys. Vesnia Ariana, of course, thinks the current slave is fine, but she's young and foolish, and the boys will always be her babies. She cannot see how they've grown, and as they're getting older, they need a firmer hand than the fellow who's been teaching them since they were barely out of nappies. If nothing else, they need toughening up before they take on their place in the ranks of the military. The gods only know what back end of nowhere they'll be sent to. Vesnia Ariana hopes that it will be so quiet that they will never have to lift a spear, but that's not right. Nor do I think it's very likely the way things are, so I hush her and remind her that it's all still a few years off. So, for the acquiring of a new tutor, I would value your judgments in the matter. If you have a moment, please do let me know if you have any suggestions. Anyway, I digress. We set off early, as I said. The walk across town would take us, I estimated, half the morning, perhaps more with the crowds out for the festival. It was a beautiful day, and our spirits were high, but already warm even at that early hour. Vesnia Ariana and the girls slowed our pace a bit, but we were moving with the crowds that slowly increased as time passed. Almost everyone was heading to the heart of the city, and many of them had the same idea as us, to make an early start. Despite the heat, it was a pleasant walk, and I was able to point out many of the finer buildings on our route once we had passed a certain point, and tell the stories associated with them. As you know, the dwellings in the district between our home and the old city are not the best. The houses are poorly built, and look as if they are about to tumble into one another. The plebs who live there one family on top of another are no better. I saw them sitting in the street, watching the world with no industrious thought in their head. The women throw waste into the street without a care, usually over a swollen belly or a crying child on the hip. I had to instruct Vesnia Ariana to avert her eyes more than once as disreputable characters came too close and the slave had to step in to ward them off. Really, something must be done. The Senate should be made aware of the poor state of that part of town and the citizens who frequent it. What a contrast when one passes under the aqueduct into the old city. The air seemed instantly fresher, the streets cleaner, and despite the crowd, one felt, well, safer. Once again, I could instruct Vesnia Ariana in the finer points of architecture of the city. We walked on, past the Colosseum, where we had to push through the crowds gathering for the circus, and a dense line of hawkers and merchants who were doing a very fine trade in the crowds. Vesnia Ariana was tiring by now, but I pushed us on until we came to the forum. We rested there finding a step near the Temple of Saturn in some shade, and I paid my respects at the altar. I have to say, the temple is looking a bit neglected nowadays. Its restoration is overdue, but it's going to be a big job for a consul sometime soon. I wonder who'll be able to take it on. The forum itself was bustling with stalls set up the whole length of it, sometimes two or three deep, and just as you would expect on such a day. I don't mean the usual sort of busy, but really very crowded. I swear every out-of-town tradesman had come in for the day, loaded down with whatever he had to sell, and of course every man who could afford to take the time off was out with his family and some slave or other. As well as the vendors there were hawkers of every kind of trinket you can imagine, food from every corner of the world being cooked and sold, and some shady types taking money off the young men at dice and other games of chance. In one corner I even saw some players setting up their stage. I was instantly reminded of the day some 30 years ago when you and I sat near the very same spot, waiting for a play to start. Do you remember it? We had absconded from our lessons that day, which no doubt caused our tutor much consternation, and spent the afternoon circulating in the forum. The player, on his stage partly built over the temple steps, had shouted at us, complimenting our fine clothes and our noble bearing, offering us the best seats he had. We were young then, and easily flattered probably ready for a sit-down too, so we took up his offer, only to find his best seats were the same patch of hard ground as all the others. And then, when you grumbled at him, he suggested you might take up an offer of entertaining his leading lady after the show. 
When he called her on, unmasked, and all could see her three-day beard, well, (laughs) that gave them a good laugh at us. So much for being the young bucks in town, eh? Even though he'd got the better of us, I think it was then that we knew that this was not the best troop doing the rounds. Who knows how they got such a good spot? They must have lined the right pocket, I suppose. Still, I remember they made a decent pass at the play. It was Plautus, I think. He did seem a bit old-fashioned even then, but there was enough jesting and diving between the columns to keep us amused. I suppose many of the topical jokes of the day went over our heads then, so perhaps I'm being unkind to the players. I do remember being impressed with the dancing at the end, at the wedding guests gathered, and the music was good. Even a small ensemble can produce sounds that cut through the noise of the crowd. It is strange to think that for all we know, they're still travelling the countryside performing the very same plays all these years later. If I remember right, we did give them some coin at the end. Perhaps it was out of pity, but more likely the player intimidated us into a contribution as we left. I did take a thrashing for that afternoon's entertainment, though. It took Father a long time to forgive me, despite me being on best behaviour for weeks. Anyway, they were good times for both of us, I think. Happy memories. So, back to yesterday. Rested, we continued on our way, heading ever westward. Having covered most of the distance before our stop in the Forum, we soon came to the theatre, just as the summer smell of the Tiber greeted us, and that is something one never forgets. We could see the impressive structure of the theatre long before we finally approached it, and then we went through a small archway in the outer wall. This provided a blessed moment of shade and cool air, but we were then quickly out into the sunlight and heat again. To our delight, we found ourselves not immediately in the theatre itself, but in an extensive garden area, with manicured green spaces and several fountains, eight or twelve I think in total, which, as chance would have it, burst into life just as we entered. I heard that providing the water for this extravagance is quite difficult, as they use a big supply of water, and as you know, the aqueducts in that part of town are in a bit of a bad state. But we were fortunate, and we saw the watery display from the start. I immediately instructed the slave woman to see Vesnia Ariana to a seat by some water, in the shade, so that she could recover, and my man to watch over them, and I went to look at the buildings that lined both sides of the garden. Although the performance wasn't due to start for a while, the gardens, which are called the Inner Cryptia, were already filling with people. Mostly they gathered by the fountains or in the shady areas, slowly following the shadow of the buildings as the sun moved on. The whole area is beautifully paved in white marble, and I wandered slowly towards one side of the garden, taking in each fountain and the planting and stopping to pass time of day with any acquaintance that I came across. One side of the gardens is composed of rooms set aside to display many items of interest. It took me a long time to move through all the rooms to study the artworks and other items there, but I didn't mind. The rooms were shady and cool, and in some there were slaves positioned to hand out sweet water. On one occasion I even got a cup of wine. Statues, mosaics, displays of musical instruments, displays of shields and spears recovered from barbarian lands, and several unusual foreign items, the purpose of which I could not fathom. It was all quite fascinating. I made a complete circuit of the gardens until I was back near where we had entered. At this end, there is a fine portico. It is named the Porticus Pompeii and houses rooms that are to be used for the Senate, or so I hear. Now, I'm not sure why the Senate house is no longer sufficient for their needs, but that surely is the proper place for governance of the city. In any event, perhaps their debates will be calmer and a deal more productive if carried out in this location amongst the beauty of nature and man-made art. Let's hope so, for there's no doubt that we live in troubled times. And I do worry that the politics will then be happening, literally, under the very name of Gnaeus Pompeius. Much as I admire and respect him, I wonder if this is wise. Should his influence really pervade so? As I walked past one room, I could hear a debate in progress, full of young hotheads who seemed to be calling for Gaius Julius to bring the Gallic Wars to an end and get back to Rome. Personally, I'm not sure it's that simple. Maybe with Marcus Licinius serving in Anatolia as proconsul, things will relax a bit, but I have to say, the city did seem a bit fractious. I saw at least one gang of youths roaming around in their boisterous, rather threatening way they have. It's the summer heat, I know, but if we're not careful, we'll have the Senate calling on Gnaeus Pompeius to put a lid on them, and I don't think anyone wants soldiers in the city. 
It never ends well when things get that far. Ah, my pen is running away with me. I know I can trust you to be discreet, my friend, but perhaps I'd better get off politics before I get into trouble. I have fortified myself with another cup of your fine wine, as this is turning into a rather longer letter than I intended. I hope that you too are able to still enjoy the finer things in life. Do let us know if you're lacking anything that we could send you. My lands on the coast are producing an abundance of vegetables this year. The weather has been good through the spring and the early summer, thank the gods, so I would be only too happy to furnish you with some supplies if you have any needs. Having passed most of the afternoon looking at the displays, I retraced my steps and searched out Vesnia Ariana and the slaves. They had looked after her well and bought some food that had been sold from stalls set up all around the gardens. Sensibly, she had stuck to some plain vegetables with bread and olive oil. I myself had seen all sorts of delicacies for sale in the gardens. Ostrich skewers, lamb's brains, sow's womb, even flamingo tongues, and that old favourite the dormouse, along with so many other treats being hawked around. But from the street, any of this is guaranteed to put your humours out of balance, and it's a recipe for a few days of stomach cramps and purgatives, so I resisted. There were even men up from Ostia with fish to snack on, and I'm sure I saw a stack of sea urchins on one stall. You can imagine the smell in the summer heat, quite enough to put the most dedicated pescatarian off. So, I stuck to the bread and some fresh fruit. My friend, I do apologise. This talk of food is probably not helping you. I'll, I'll press on. Together we made our way towards the theatre, again keeping to the shady side of the inner crypt here. We went through the doors and into passageways that led to the seating in the auditorium. Slaves inquired of our party and pointed us to our seating area. We were not in the best seats, but we had not expected that, and it's no slight on the generosity of Gaius Camillius Galabrio to mention this, for frankly, I was happy enough to be away from the senators at the front and those keen enough on the theatre or the latest actor who's caught their fancy to force their way to the best seats. I hear even in this grand place there can be trouble in the audience, and it's best to be away from those hotheads. But I must tell you about the theatre itself. It is quite breathtaking. We came out from the passage to the auditorium in the second tier, so quite high up. So much so, in fact, that Vesnia Ariana had to take a seat rather quickly, lest she pitch forward and take a tumble. She has no head for heights. You immediately see the stage and orchestra. And first, it is the scale of the area that astounds you. The orchestra has a marble pattern floor and protrudes from the front of the stage in a semicircle, as you would expect. The stage has six columned areas, the two in the middle being of red marble and thinner than the other sets of white marble pillars on either side. Above each set is another level of stone column that supports the roof of the stage and the theatre. The three doors are of traditional type, but very grand of course, and with the sets of red columns between them. This is very useful for the play, as there are many areas for actors to hide in and not be seen by the errant wife or the slavish master. They can listen in discreetly and really seem hidden from all but the audience. The pillars are all set on a raised area, so that also gives plenty of opportunity for the actors to leap around and avoid each other in the chase when necessary. I had taken all of this in as we entered, and had then taken a seat myself as I felt quite overwhelmed. I mean, it is what we are used to seeing in the theatre. There's an auditorium, an orchestra, Scania and Scania Franz, as you would expect. But it is so big. It's so well-fashioned, so grand and, well, so solid. We've never seen the like, and I'm sure the building will be standing for hundreds of years from now. Indeed, for eternity. Because it is the pinnacle of what a theatre should be. One of the slaves in attendance told me that it took a full seven years to construct, and I can quite believe it. Seeing I was a jolly chap, he chanced a joke with me about the depth of the pockets of Gnaeus Pompeius, but my respect for the former consul means I cannot repeat it here, amusing as it was. When I stood again and turned around, I saw that we were a little below and to one side of the temple of Venus Victrix. I paid my respects to the goddess from a distance and realised for the first time what a holy place this is. Not just a theatre, but a true home to the goddess. I had heard the stories, of course, about the supposed trickery by Gnaeus Pompeius to get the theatre built, but I could see instantly that his intentions were pure, and it's right to place the goddess, who he loves so well, in the heart of this temple of art. 
The walls of the theatre reach up above the last tier of seating, and the roof cleverly gives shade to some of the seating, more and more as the sun goes down. The curve of the wall is a thing of beauty in itself, so smooth and perfectly formed, it is surely etched onto the shape of Rome for ever. As we sat and watched the other members of the audience slowly take their seats, the musicians started to set up and tune their instruments. It was amazing how we could hear their muted conversation, even from this great distance. With the general noise from the outside of the theatre excluded by the back wall and the gardens in front, their testing notes came clearly to our ears, and I had no doubt that we would be able to hear every word and note of the play. As the time for the performance began to draw closer, our host arrived and honoured us with a warm greeting and complimented Vesnia Ariana most graciously on her good looks. As you know, our relationship is one of business, but he showed great interest in the progress of my sons and again bestowed Vesnia Ariana with a look of true sadness as he was reminded of the loss of our youngest, which, although a full three years ago now, still gives my wife great pain. He introduced her to his wife and suggested that she should visit their villa for companionship and entertainment. His wife, I have to say, looked a little sour, but agreed to the plan nonetheless, and then said that Vesnia Ariana was to expect her husband's invitation. She has a strange turn of phrase. Our host then spoke briefly to me on some matters of business which sound most encouraging, and it's likely I'll soon have to invest in at least one more ship to meet his demands for goods he needs. The army, it seems, always needs further supply of some necessity or other. Our host then took his leave to go to his own seat with an invitation to join his party in the inner cryptia after the performance for a cup of wine. We settled back into our seats again, which are constructed from beautiful marble that cooled the body in a most pleasing way. But I was glad that we had the foresight to bring cushions with us. Then I caught sight of a flurry of activity below as a person of some importance arrived. To my surprise, I saw that it was Consul Appius Claudius Pulcher. We were, of course, honoured to be in such illustrious company, but given the unrest since he was elected, one must wonder that the Consul does not have better things to do than spend hours in the theatre. I know a politician has to be seen by the people, but to come to this place and take some of Gnaeus Pompeius's shine, for that sure I'm what he was hoping for, well, that's not the behaviour of an honourable man. A flock of lesser types and minor senators orbited around him until he too found his seat, one of the best in the house, of course. I had some fun spotting the senators who'd chosen to sit away from his sphere. Probably his own people were doing the same, marking cards for the future. I was startled out of this occupation by the clash of the cymbals as the musicians came to take their place on the side of the stage. The performance was beginning. The tibia player stood and sent beautiful music out over our heads right up to Venus Vitrix herself. The whole auditorium was hushed as the sweet notes of the pipe were picked out by the skilful player. Then the lyre joined in, then the trigonum. I have always particularly liked the sound of that small harp and it was soon joined by its big brother, the Sambuca. Such beauty must have indeed pleased the goddess. Thanks to the other distractions, I hadn't noticed that the auditorium was filling with people, but now I could see them all. The shape of the curve of the seating is such that you can see your fellow audience members without craning around too much. It was wonderful to see my fellow Roman citizens and be part of them. I swear I saw Rome at its best that evening. I can quite believe that I was one of at least 10,000 people in the theatre. Maybe it was double that. I'm not sure. And we have all heard such truly wild numbers banded around. Whatever the case, it felt like the best of Rome was with us that evening. I suppose the numbers are not so much more than in the theatre for the last spring festival. But this is so much grander, so much more solid. This is Rome glorified. And I for one think it's a long overdue addition to the city. Gnaeus Pompeius certainly knows how to be a friend to the citizen, but I do worry a little. The golden statues that adorn almost every alcove, the gold leaf in the decorations, the perfection of the marble that covers the stage and the orchestra, it's a little, well, overpowering. And I heard more than one voice questioning the expense of it all. Apparently, two temples had to be moved to make the space for the theatre on this site, 
Annaeus Pompeius more or less told the Guardians, and the Senate probably, that it just had to happen. I detect an undercurrent of dissatisfaction with him. It's small and quietly stated, I grant you, but it's there, and maybe he needs to be careful, or we'll end up with Gaius Julius in charge. You know that Gnaeus Pompeius has not been seen much in the city since the end of his consulship. Of course you do, the whole city does. People do wonder what exactly he's up to. But this, my dear friend, is not the stuff for a letter. I draw a discreet veil over my speculations and trust to your honour that nothing of this will be repeated. It's a conversation that we can have in private when we walk through your olive groves when you're well enough for me to pay you a visit. I hope it can be soon, if only for my own selfish need to escape the heat of the city before the summer gets too unbearable. Enough. With a replenished cup, I take you back to the entertainment. After the music, we were treated to singing by the chorus, calling for the blessing of the gods and reminding us all to pay our proper respects to them as is their due. The correct libations were made at the altar as the chorus sung. This was a long piece and we were relieved for the short break in proceedings once it was done. Suddenly the auditorium was alive with legs being stretched, backs being rubbed and numb backsides being massaged back into life. Traders ran through the aisles, offering refreshments as quickly as they could to any who would buy. I shooed them past us, not wishing to part with hard-earned money for what was no doubt inferior goods. The watery wine was tempting, I'll grant you, but the late afternoon sun was still on us and I, I had no wish to be drowsy during the play. A fanfare on the Curran announced the beginning of the next part of the evening. The hawkers scattered and the audience settled. Music filled the air again, and we were treated to the pantomime of the return of Agamemnon to Argos. The mime was beautifully performed, with each movement either in time to the music or acting as a counterpoint to it. The gestures were exquisite, and told the fated story with great clarity. There is, I think, nothing more beautiful than the mime, who can touch your soul and reach in and caress your heart. They speak without words, and my own poor words can never do it justice. The death of Augustus marked the end of the pantomime, and I would have been satisfied if the evening had ended there. Indeed, I would have preferred it to, for the next two short mimes were presented, and I didn't like these so much. They joked rather crudely, mocking Rome itself and its fine traditions at one point, which I found most distasteful, and I was not alone. One section of the audience heckled the play, calling curses on the performers for their disrespect with loud voice. I held my counsel, not wishing to cause any disrespect to my host. The second mime was a story about an errant wife, taking a visit from her lover and then having to hide it as the husband returns. It was quite funny, until it seemed to me that the wronged husband bore a striking resemblance to Gnaeus Pompeius, and I did not like the implications of that. There was more heckling, But this quietened down when Appius Clodius sent a man over to have a word with those who were shouting loudest. They soon went quiet, but I do wonder that the consul allowed the mime to continue at all. Another short break, and then the final part of the entertainment, which was that classic by Publius Terentius, Andrea. I know you know it well, so enough to say that it was a good production, which seemed quite contemporary. It's strange to think that it's a hundred years old. I think most of the audience enjoyed the physical comedy and the lavish costumes. For myself, I was listening out for the verbal jokes. Publius Terentius was always so good with a pun. I had quite a few quiet chuckles to myself, which most others missed, I'm sure. And there it was. Once the final dance was done and the actors had briefly acknowledged our appreciation, the evening was over. We filed out surprisingly quickly into the gardens, where most people lingered. The theatre is such a clever design, whereby a large number of people can make their way out of the auditorium very quickly. They go through the vomitorium and into the inner cryptia. This was just as the evening was coming on, so most were happy to stay and buy some more food or watch some of the street entertainers for a while. We found our host and waited near to give him our thanks. He offered us some refreshments, but we only quickly partook of some water and some portable snacks on account of our long walk home. It would already be after dark before we got home, and we were keen to traverse the rougher parts of the city before the light had gone completely. So, our great day ended. And I find this is also true of the jug of wine at my side. I'm quite exhausted with the thought of our grand day out. I shall just dispatch this letter to you and have a little bit of a lie down.
If sleep comes, I shall dream of the theatrical life of the city, the oasis of culture that is surely our greatest gift to the world. People might champion our buildings, our military might, our aqueducts, even our sewers, but surely it is our theatre that will live on and will never be forgotten. We educate, we entertain, and we bring happiness to people. What more could they want? The Republic will surely live forever, and the greatest of times are yet to come. Thank you.